Okay, here we are back again with more Dragon Age Origins Awakening. And uh, I think we're about ready Let's to... Get started. Uh, actually... Actually, what I want to do... Um... Actually, what I want to do... Uh, before we head out to the Black Marsh, I actually, uh, the Disciples, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about Disciples later as we get going. Um, I wanna read a few Codex entries, because there are some interesting ones in here, before we go to the Black Marsh. So here we have Pilgrims and Amaranthine. So this tells us a little bit more about, sort of, the religious significance of Amaranthine, and what it is for. And why uh, there's places called like the Pilgrim's Path. Um, the faithful travel great distances to see the birthplace of Andraste in Denerim, yet many make their pilgrimage longer still by visiting Amaranthine. After all, it was from the city's port that Maferath and his army departed to invade the Deventer Imperium, and the Chantry of Our Lady Redeemer now stands on the site where Andraste first revealed the Chant of Light. This is why the road that joins Amaranthine to Denerim is known as the Pilgrim's Path, and why the Chantry of Our Lady Redeemer is the wealthiest Chantry in all of Ferelden. Uh, so yeah, that's that explains a bit of the religious significance of Amaranthine. Um, here's one on the Crown and Lion, which is the inn in Amaranthine. Uh, one Saturnalia long ago, a bevy of bards met in Amaranthine to determine whose songs best stirred emotion and whose stomachs best digested foul brew. The first bard fell, mid-ballad, into his barley soup, the second into the lap of a lass most fair. Some say forfeiture was worth the price. The next could not keep his innards inside. One by one, they succumbed to fatigue, boredom, or insobriety. At the end, no man was left standing. There was only I, the lovely and fair Rosalind, master and mistress of the crown and lion, who proved that no man is mightier than the slightest of lasses. From the War of Lions by the Bard Rosalind. That's really cool. Uh, okay, so here's some more history about Amaranthine. Outside of Ferelden, the city of Amaranthine is now synonymous with the Arling herself, but before the Orlesian invasion, it was only a modest fishing village, despite a deep port well suited to commerce. At that time, few other kingdoms had any need to trade with the Ferelden barbarians. The city changed rapidly when the Orlesians came. They built temporary docks to accommodate ships packed with chevaliers, and for a time, Amaranthine was the capital of occupied Ferelden. The ban of Amaranthine became one of the wealthiest nobles in the kingdom as goods like wool were leached from the city's swollen ports. During the liberation, the fleeing Orlesians looted the city, but left it otherwise unscarred. She recovered quickly. Ironically, Amaranthine's current prosperity is the legacy of Orlesian occupation. Do not share that opinion with the locals, mind. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so yeah, that talks a little bit about Amaranthine's importance. Uh, here's one on the Howes. The Howes of Amaranthine are one of the oldest noble families in Ferelden. Their lineage traces to the time of Callanhad, when Elias Howe was one of the first freeholders to follow Callanhad. During the occupation, Arl Tarleton Howe, Rendon Howe's father, threw his lot in with the Orlesians. After several bitter battles with rebels, the town of Harper's Ford, an outpost governed by Tarleton Howe, fell to the Kuzlans of Highever. Tarleton hanged. Rendon brought the Howe family over to the side of Merrick Theron and Loghain MacTeer's rebellion. Rendon's bravery at the Battle of White River, fighting alongside Bryce Kuzland, earned back his family's honor. When King Merrick took the throne and free Ferelden, Rendon Howe was decorated for his service. From Annals of Northern Ferelden by Brother Bedeen Chantry Scholar. Uh, so yeah. Uh, Antiva. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah, 
Alright, we've got a lot of interesting ones here. Um, the Avars. I'm not sure if I've read this yet. It's not blinking like it's new, but I'm pretty sure there's some stuff in here that we don't know much about. Um, driven across the Frostbacks in ancient times, the Alamari tribesmen split into three groups. One settled the Ferelden Valley, one was pushed into the Korkari Wilds, and the last returned to the mountains. Modern Ferelden's bear little resemblance to their Al Alamari ancestors, and the chastened remember few of their traditions, but the Avars have changed little throughout the, year the ages. Basically, the Avars are uh, like a holdout of like the original people who were in the Ferelden Valley before it was known as Ferelden. Like the Chastened, the Avars are not a united people. Each tribe fends for itself and is beholden only to its thane. They still follow their own gods, Korth the Mountain Father, Hakon Winter's Breath, the Lady of the Skies, as well as dozens of animal gods never named to outsiders. Nothing lasts in the mountains. Wind and rain eventually eat away the strongest holds. Valleys that were arable one generation are locked in year-round ice the next. Game is constantly on the move. Even among themselves, the Avar make no absolute promises. They wed by a tradition in which the groom struggles to untie a tightly knotted rope while the bride sings a hymn to one of the gods. However many knots he has undone by the time her song ends is the number of years she will spend with him. Lowlanders often forget that there is no such thing as a permanent alliance in the Frostbacks. Uh, so that's an interesting little nugget of information on the Avars. Um, here's some information on the Banorn. Uh, Alistair mentioned that there's some trouble in the Banorn that he has to help deal with, and that's like part of the reason why he can't be here to help me with my problems. Thanks, honey. Um, so let's let's learn a little bit about what the Banorn is and what it, what its importance is. Uh, the central Ferelden Valley has always been a paradox. No single ban holds more than a few dozen leagues of farmland, yet together they govern a greater territory than all the Terns and Arls combined. This collection of independent bands is known as the Banorn, and it is the heart of Ferelden politics. No person has ever sat upon the throne of Ferelden without first winning the approval of the Banorn. Queen Fion, who had the misfortune to take the throne in the 18th year of the Steel Age, wrote of the Banorn, There have been three wars this year fought over elopements, five fought over wool, and one started by an apple tree. It isn't even winter yet. Who would believe that these same bands, now trying so hard to kill one another, just last year united to give me the crown? Uh, so yeah, that's the Banorn. It's basically a bunch of- it's basically like the breadbasket of Ferelden, so it's really important. Um, so here's some information on the city elves, uh, from the, the first- uh, from the, uh, sort of the end of the main campaign, when we were- we spent a lot of time in the alienage. Um, when the Holy Exalted March of the Dales resulted in the dissolution of the Elven Kingdom, leaving a great many elves homeless once again, the Divine Renata I declared that all lands loyal to the Chantry must give the elves refuge within their own walls. Considering the atrocities committed by the elves at Red Crossing... Um, by the way, this is an in-universe text. It is not objective. It is obviously incredibly biased against the elves and in favor of the Chantry. This is not necessarily literal truth. This is this is a really good example of why we, we, we take most codex entries with a massive grain of salt. Because a lot of them are extremely biased. Mo many of them are written by like chantry people like right like sister patrine and brother genitivi are members of the chantry so they have very specific biases now brother genitivi is generally pretty good like he's a pretty decent historian he's good at pointing out his own biases um and generally keeping relatively objective um but that's not always the case and this is one really egregious case where this is like extremely biased um like this is like they're the elves the the elves themselves would tell a completely different story about how they lost the dales and what happened for as far as the elves were concerned the retaking of the dales was a, a an aggressive war of expansion 
uh, and it was not an exalted march. And in fact, even among humans, there's a lot of argument about whether the exalted march of the Dales should even be called the exalted march of the Dales, because it wasn't technically an exalted march in the sense of all of the kingdoms of Thetis coming together to repel some massive threat to the Chantry. It was literally just the Orlesian army came and, t and took the Dales, and the Divine at that time said, okay, we'll call this an exalted march because that made it sound better, right? So this is this is a major this is a major through line, uh, especially even within the Codex, right? The Codex itself is not necessarily objective or even always historically accurate in Dragon Age because they're always written in universe and the people who write them have often have very specific biases. Um, so yeah, this is this is a, a ch a, an extremely biased Chantry perspective on the elves. Um, so right, there was one condition, however. The elves were to lay aside their pagan gods and live under the rule of the Chantry. Some of the elves refused our goodwill. They banded together to form the wandering Dalish elves, keeping their old elven ways and their hatred of humans alive. To this day, Dalish elves still terrorize those of us who stray too close to their camps. Most of the elves, however, saw that it was wisest to live under the protection of humans. And so we took the elves into our cities and tried to integrate them. We invited them into our own homes and gave them jobs as servants and farmhands. Here in Denerim, the elves even have their own quarter, governed by an elven keeper. Most have proven to be productive members of society. Still, a small segment of the elven community remains dissatisfied. These troublemakers and malcontents roam the streets, causing mayhem, rebelling against authority, and making a general nuisance of themselves. So yeah, um, obviously this is extremely racist, extremely biased. Um, but it does have some nuggets of truth in it, right? So the elves were, the Dales were taken away from the elves after a certain point. Some of the elves refused to, uh, try to even attempt to integrate into human society and they became the Dalish tribes. And some elves, uh, chose to, um move into the cities, right? And that's how we have the alienages, and that's how we have this this divide between city elves and the Dalish. Um, and if you play the city elf origin in Origins, uh, you see that the city elves d do, by and large, now follow Andrastianism. They are mostly Andrastian. Um, they still retain some of their old beliefs, um, but here's one on alienage culture. Uh, so this is an elf, an, an elf's perspective on the city elves. There have always been alienages. They have been around for as long as elves and Shems have lived in the same lands. Ours isn't even the worst. They say that Valroyo has 10,000 elves living in a space no bigger than Denerim's market. Their walls are supposedly so high that daylight doesn't reach the Venadal until midday. But don't be so anxious to start tearing down the walls and picking fights with the guards. They keep out more than they keep in. We don't have to live here, you know. Sometimes a family gets a good break, and they buy a house in the docks or the outskirts of town. If they're lucky, they come back to the alienage after the looters have burned their house down. The unlucky ones just go to the pauper's field. Pauper's field, of course, is where you bury dead paupers, right? Somebody dies and doesn't have enough money for a proper church burial, you put them in a pauper's field. Here, we're among family. We look out for each other. Here, we do what we can to remember the old ways. The flat ears who have gone out there, they're stuck. They'll never be human, and they've gone and thrown away being elven, too. So where does that leave them? Nowhere. Sarethia, Haran of the High Ever Alienage. Um, and there's, of course, also a lot of divisions within elvish culture, right? The Dalish often look down on city elves, and the city elves in the alienages often look down on elves who don't live in the alienage, right? Um, so, like, there's hierarchies even among the elves. Um, the elves are not completely innocent victims, um, you know. Um, or, or should I say, they're not, they're not, um, they're not perfect angels who never do anything wrong necessarily either, right? No, nobody is in Dragon Age, that's kind of the point. Um, let's see, this is about the occupation of Ferelden. Of course, the events leading up to um, Merrick having to take his throne back in the Stolen Throne novel, with Loghain's help. 
The occupation was a dark blot on Ferelden's history. Our people, who from time immemorial valued their freedom over all else, were forced to bow to Orlesian rule. The Empire declared our elves property and sold them like cattle. Chevaliers routinely plundered freeholds of coin, food, and even women and children, and excused it as taxation. And for seventy years no lands meets were held, for the imperial throne had declared our ancient laws a form of treason. King Brandel was one of those who escaped. He tried to organize the other fugitive lords to retake their land, but Brandel was neither clever nor persuasive, and the nobles preferred to take their chances alone. Ferelden might still be little more than a territory of the Empire were it not for the fact that his daughter had all the charisma that her royal father lacked. The Rebel Queen's rule began with a midnight attack on the Imperial Armory at Lothering. It was swift and successful, and with their pilfered arms, the rebels began a campaign against the Orlesians in earnest. But the turning point of the war came when a young freeholder joined the Queen's army. The lad, Loghain Mactir, possessed a remarkable talent for strategy and quickly became the favorite advisor of young Prince Merrick. The Queen finally died at the hands of Orlesian sympathizers anxious to curry favor with their painted masters, and Merrick took her place as the leader of the rebellion. Loghain became Merrick's right hand. Merrick and Loghain led the rebels in a new campaign against the Orlesian oppressors, culminating in the Battle of Riverdane, where the last chevaliers in Denerim were crushed. With the capital once more in the hands of Ferelden's, the battle to free our people was finally over. But the battle to rebuild what had been lost had only just begun. Um, so yeah, obviously this is an extremely biased account of a Ferelden, you know, uh, a Ferelden account of the Orlesian occupation of Ferelden. Um, here's an interesting bit on the free marches. Um, it's good to know a little bit about the free marches going into Dragon Age 2, because Dragon Age 2 takes place primarily in the free marches. In fact, it takes place specifically in Kirkwall, which is one of the, uh, which is one of the more important cities in the free marches. Um, so the Free Marches are not a kingdom, nor even a nation in the most basic sense. People from that region dislike even being lumped together as marchers. Rather, they are a collection of independent city-states, united only when it suits them. In this respect, they resemble the Banorn before the arrival of King Callanhad. Because of this, the Free Marches have no capital, and what passes for a central government exists only sporadically, a sort of landsmeet that convenes only during times of crisis. I arrived in time for the Grand Tourney while it was on in Tantravale, a remarkable sight indeed. I saw Avar Hillsmen test their mettle against Orlesian Chevaliers, riders from the Anderfels buying Navarran cavalry horses, and Tevan craftsmen selling their wares to Tevinter mages. All of Thetis was on display. So yeah, the Grand Tourney is, is a thing that happens, I think, I think it's once a year, I think it's an annual thing. And it happens in a different city in the Free Marches every year. Um, and it, yeah, it's just it's basically what it sounds like. It's a giant tournament um, that anybody can enter, and people come from all over Thetis to to enjoy it. It's one of the chief, it's one of the chief sort of selling points of the Free Marches as a as a geographical region. Um, here's an interesting thing on Guarin. Um, Guarin uh, is a, a, an important port city in Ferelden, uh, and is also the uh, the seat of the Ternier of uh, of Guarin, which uh, Loghain Mactir was the Tern of Guarin. The human settlement of Guarin is built directly on top of a dwarven outpost by the same name. Prior to the First Blight, in a time when Ferelden was not yet a nation and was still carved up into barbarian tribes, the outpost served as a source of salt and a means by which the dwarves could reach the sea lanes of the Amaranthine Ocean. Unwilling to come to the surface, the dwarves made an agreement with the local Tairn to build a port and relied on the humans to ferry goods between the ships and the underground outpost. This made Guarin a prosperous place and extraordinarily wealthy for a time. When, in the Divine Age, the dwarven kingdoms fell to the darkspawn and the deep roads were closed off, so too did the dwarves disappear from Guarin. The human settlement, the envy of surrounding barbarian tribes, was assaulted and sacked, its wealth stolen. The town remained, however, and despite its remote location, continued to find value as a source of fish and timber. As the first settlement liberated by King Merrick and Loghain during the Ferelden Rebellion, Guarin was eventually granted to Loghain when he became Tern in 911 Dragon. So yeah, Loghain was the, Guar was the Tern of Guarin. Uh, here's one on High Ever. Um, this is uh, the place where if you play uh, a human noble, basically a non-mage human origin, 
uh, you are a, a scion of the ruling house of High Ever. So you're you're from High Ever, basically, if you play as a Kuzland. Castle High Ever has stood since the Divine Age, when it was not an independent Banorn, but merely an outpost of the growing Banorn of Amaranthine, in the days before Amaranthine became an Arling itself. The outpost of High Ever was originally held by the Elston family, cousins of the Howes. In the Age of Towers, however, Ban Conobar Elston was murdered by his wife Flemeth, thus ending the bloodline. Conobar's captain of the guard, Sarim Kuzland, took the lands and title. The Kuzlans declared their independence from Am Amaranthine, starting a war that lasted thirty years. When the dust settled, High Ever was on its own, and in possession of half the land that had once been southwestern Amaranthine. High Ever became a Ternier during the Black Age, when Halia Kuzland gathered the lords together under her banner to drive the werewolves out of their lands, earning herself the title of Terna almost as an afterthought. Today, High Ever is one of only two remaining Terniers, making the Kuzland family second in rank only to the king. Arl Howe of Amaranthine was named the new Tern of High Ever under somewhat questionable circumstances, and the fate of the Kuzland family is now uncertain. Um, that's because if you play the Kuzland origin, your family gets murdered by Rendon Howe in the beginning of the game. You're one of the only survivors. Um, th though actually, canonically, Fergus Kuzland always survives. Um, so Fergus, uh, will survive, uh, I believe, I believe as of, like, Dragon Age 2, it's officially sort of canon that Fergus is now the, 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 the new Terran of High Ever. Uh, if you play as the Kuzland origin, Fergus is your brother. Um, and, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure that, uh, Ogren actually mentioned Fergus Kuzland, um, at one point, um, because Fergus, of course, fought in the Blight, um, so it's definitely possible that Ogren knew knew who he was, uh, was aware of him. Uh, so here's the noble families of Ferelden. So yeah, um, that's part of why Howe was, d doesn't like the Kuzlans is because sort of originally the Howes were kind of the overlords of the Kuzlans and the Kuzlans were kind of just stewards. And then eventually the Kuzlans uh, eventually became more important even than the Howes. Uh, even though technically, I suppose you could say the How the Howes are an older family, right? Uh, but the Kuzlans became more important. Uh, here's one on the noble families of Ferelden. Um, this is all stuff from sort of the last third or so of the of the of the game, the first game. So the occupation left empty castles in its wake. Whole families were butchered in the initial invasion, and all those who couldn't or wouldn't bend the knee to the emperor's puppet king were declared traitors and hunted. Many bloodlines ended on chevaliers' blades at dusty crossroads, in forest clearings, or in freeholds. And then there were the turncoats. To curry favor with their new masters, some nobles took up arms against their brothers. They betrayed and murdered the rebel queen, an act that created even more vacant titles and lands once King Merrick exacted justice. That Ferelden did not fall apart after the Orlesians left is a testament to the strength of King Merrick. The old families still held grudges against those who had sided with the emperor, and those new families that had been granted titles were viewed as interlopers. The landsmeets that followed Merrick's coronation were tense, to say the least. Yeah, like, it's honestly, it's kind of a wonder that people, that families like the Kuzlans and Howes managed to uh, survive the Orlesian occupation at all. Um, they were very lucky. A lot of old families simply did not survive. Uh, so here's some interesting stuff on the Kunari. Again, um, we had Sten in our party uh, in the main game, um, and he taught us a little bit about the Kuhn and the Kunari people. Um, they're going to become even more important in Dragon Age 2. So again, it's kind of uh, good, it's a good idea to, to know a little bit about them going in because they are going to play a more significant role going forward. So this is a, a, a codex entry titled Parvalin, the Occupied North. In the 30th year of the Steel Age, the first Kunari ships were sighted off the coast of Parvalin in the far north, marking the beginning of a new age of warfare. History calls this the First Kunari War, but it was mostly a one-sided bloodbath with the Kunari advancing far into the mainland. Kunari warriors in glittering steel armor carved through armies with ease. 
their cannons, the likes of which our ancestors had never seen, reduced city walls to rubble in a matter of seconds. That's because basically the Kunari showed up with gunpowder and nobody else in Thetis had gunpowder at the time. Stories of Kunari occupation vary greatly. It is said they dismantled families and sent captives to learning camps for indoctrination into their religion. Those who refused to cooperate disappeared into mines or construction camps. For every tale of suffering, however, there is another of enlightenment deriving from something called the Kune. This is either a philosophical code or a written text that governs all aspects of Kunari life. Perhaps both. It's a little of both, actually. One converted Saharan reported pity for those who refused to embrace the Kune, as if the conquerors had led him to a sort of self-discovery. For all my life, I followed the Maker whatever, wherever his path led me, he wrote. But in the Kune, I have found the means to travel my own path. It has been said that the most complete way to wipe out a people is not with blades, with, but with books. Thankfully, a world that had repelled four blights would not easily bow to a foreign aggressor, and so the exalted marches began. The greatest advantage of the Chantry-led forces was the Circle of Magi. Yeah, for all their technology, the Kunari appeared to harbor great hatred for magic. This is true and is going to continue to bear out as we get deeper into the, into the series. Faced with cannons, the Chantry responded with lightning and balls of fire. The Kunari armies lacked the sheer numbers of humanity. So many were slain at Marnas Pell on both sides that the veil is said to be permanently sundered, the ruins still plagued by restless corpses. But each year the Chantry pushed further and further into the Kunari lines, although local converts to the Kune proved difficult to return to Andraste's teachings. So yeah, some people do convert willingly to the Kune. Um, for some people, not all, but for some people, it, it is a very compelling. It is a very compelling way to live your life, particularly for people who are traditionally marginalized by the chantry. Right? That's that's really the appeal of the Kune is is particularly to those who are disadvantaged under the chantry. So elves, for instance, um, tend to be. Um, some of them tend to be uh, very susceptible to the Kune, I guess you could say, if you want to put it that way, right? Um, by the end of the Storm Age, the Kunari were truly pushed back. Ravain was the only human land that retained the Kunari religion after being freed, and its rulers attempted to barter a peace. Most human lands signed the Lomeran Accord, accepting the Tevinter Imperium. It is a shaky peace that has lasted to this day. So yeah, technically speaking, the only human land still at war with the Kunari is the Tevinter Imperium, and they have been since the Storm Age, right? Since the end of the Storm Age. Everybody else signed the Lomeran Accord, including the Kunari, but um, the Tevinter Imperium refused, and they are essentially the, the, the northern front of the war against the Kunari, and, and technically they've been at war with the Kunari for like 300 years now. And that's going to become more significant later on as well. Um, so here's uh, a little bit on the Venadol, which is the giant tree that's in the alienage in Denerim. Mostly the old ways are gone. Each generation forgets a little more of the old tongue, a little more of the traditions, and the few things we keep become simple habits, the meaning long since faded. So it is with the Venadol, the tree of the people. Every alienage has one, I'm told, or they used to. When I was a little girl, my mother told me the tree was a symbol of Arlathan, but not even she knew more. Keeping the Venadol is just a habit now. Many cities have let theirs wither and die, then chopped them up for firewood. No great loss. So yeah, this is uh, what's really important about this, I think, is the, the idea that the elves are gradually losing their own knowledge of... their knowledge of their own history and culture. Uh, especially the city elves. The Dalish have may maybe managed to retain a little bit more of it, or th so they think. Um, but but they have lost quite a bit. Uh, here's an interesting one on surfacer dwarves. And again, we're going to meet a lot more surface dwarves, uh, like in Dragon Age 2, and they're going to be much more important even than the ones we meet in, uh, the ones we met in Origins. Cloudgazer, Stoneblind, Skyer. These are how dwarves describe their sur surfacer cousins. It's traditional to snort these words with disdain. A dwarf who goes topside forfeits his caste, his house, and the favor of his ancestors. 
Once he sets foot on the surface, he is no longer welcome in Orzammar. Still, in recent years, a great many dwarves have moved to the surface. Some are castless and have nothing to lose. Others believe they have something to gain. Some think it's only a matter of time before Orzammar falls to the Darkspawn. Then there are the merchant caste dwarves with their frightful flair for business. I met one who nearly talked me into buying my own hat. I dare say most merchants don't give a nugget about losing their caste or the favor of their ancestors, not the way they're compensated. Uh, so yeah, we're going to learn, again, we're going to get into a lot more detail and complication on dwarven culture and sort of the, the weird, the really weird relationship between Orzammar and its surface, and the surface dwarves, uh, sort of in Dragon Age 2 and going forward. The Great Strife. Ruadan, shaman of the people, turned from the gods who had ever sheltered him. In his grief, he destroyed the gifts of the Mountain Father and brought us low. This is some kind of Avar thing. The darkness drove him to madness, but also gave him power. He turned our warriors against us. Kivial sought out the dwarves, and together they bound Ruadan in this place. Uh, here's some interesting nuggets on the First Warden. The nominal leader of our order is the First Warden, but you can expect little assistance or guidance so far from the Anderfels. Even those close to Weishaupt to learn to suffer alone. The murmurs are true. The First Warden is often embroiled in the politics of the Anderfels and has little opportunity to consider worldly matters. I would like to believe it is a matter of survival, not of political self-interest. Know that your mission is vital. You carry the hopes of our order. If the highest among us holds noble titles outside of the Anderfels, perhaps we will be better situated when the next blight comes, as we all know it must. So this is a confidential report for the Warden Commander. So this is literally a letter that somebody wrote to me about the First Warden. Alright, vassals and their liege. Some kingdoms rigidly define the rights of vassals and their duty to their liege, um, probably in or Orlais. In Ferelden, a relatively new kingdom, the Arles and Arlesses theoretically command their Arlings, bands, and lords. In practice, these lessers often zealously maintain their independence. Some Ferelden vassals must be goaded instead of ordered, swayed, not ruled. Vassals owe military obligations to their liege, yet often deny even sworn oaths and signed contracts. In contrast, the vassals expect their liege's protection despite provocation otherwise. A successful Ferelden liege applies force, persuasion, and duplicity in equal measure. So, that's interesting. Um, yeah, uh, Ferelden is kind of a weird place when it comes to, to stuff like that. Um, nominally, you know, you have charge of things, but it's not like the... <sighs> Sorry, my cat is being a being an army booger. Um, nominally, you have charge of all of these people as, you know, like, I, I'm the Arlesa of Amaranthine, right? So all of these uh, bands and lords of Amaranthine are technically sort of under me. Uh, but, but they're also, but Ferelden's are also extremely independent, and uh, they don't necessarily always abide by those kinds of, of rules and, and regulations, not the same way as they do in, like, Orlais, which is a much more which is a much more strictly stratified society. Um, so, yeah. Uh, here's one on the Vigil. Vigil's Keep is one of the oldest settlements in Ferelden, older than Denerim and Guarin. The barbarians who battled the Tevinter Imperium chose this location for a fortress so that their warning fires would be visible at great distance when Tevinter ships neared the coast. The Vigil has seen battle in every major invasion of Ferelden. Tevinters, rival barbarian clans, and Orlesians have all held her battlements. The Vigil was the first fortress to fall to the Orlesians and the last to be freed. The cellar beneath Vigil's keep retains traces of the Avar barbarians. To the Avars, the Vigil was both a fortress and a holy site. The cellars bear monuments to their gods, heroes, and their rare military victories. That's a little harsh. Rare. Alright. I'm not gonna worry too much about these different characters. We've we, we pretty much know quite a bit about these characters and where they're coming from at this point. 
meditations and odes to bees. Of course, there's there's some meditations and odes to bees. Why wouldn't there be? Feast day fish, a recipe for fluffy mackerel pudding. Uh, more stuff on the first light. A letter from Ara. Okay, this is a letter from Ara to Kristoff, which is who's the warden we're trying to find. Um, dearest Kristoff, my sister and her babe are well. I shall leave Jader as soon as they're settled. <laughs> Expect me at Vigil's Keep within the month. Ferelden is cold and wet, so make sure your socks are dry before you put them on. I know how it is with men. You can slay a thousand darkspawn, but when it comes to clean clothes and dry socks, you're hopeless. I can't wait to see you. Love, Ara. So clearly he has a wife or a, a girlfriend or something. Here's a letter to Rendon Howe. My lord Howe, some of the men are not pleased with your plan. They will incite others against you. For the plan to succeed, our forces must be united. If word gets out, if even one of them informs Kuzland, it will be your head on a plate. I say this with all due respect, sir. Your Captain Lowen. Okay. A response from Rendon Howe. Lowen, we cannot afford an insurrection. Put any troublemakers in chains. Do whatever it takes to weed them out. Whatever it takes, Lowen. Do not fail me. So this is about his, sort of his treachery. Um, Yeah. And we know all of this. I don't need to. I don't need to read to you about the controls. I think we're good there. All right. So there's lots, lots of interest. I love the Dragon Age Codex. I think it is amazing, and I'm gonna continue reading the Codex. Um, as we go forward. Um, into the series, into Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition. Um, there are going to be some repeats as we go forward, so I'll probably not read them in too much detail when we get a lot of repeats. But as we get more information and new stuff, uh, I'm definitely going to be looking into that because there's a lot of such interesting stuff in, in the Codex entries. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to leave it here because we're already like over over 35 minutes into this episode and I don't see the point in starting a new thing um, when we only really have a few minutes left. So I'm going to leave it here and next time we will go to Black Marsh, I promise. <laughs> As always, if you like what you see, please like, comment, subscribe and we'll see you in the next episode. Later!